If you look at actual policies, decisions that have to be implemented or are being implemented right now as opposed to promises of how, what they'll do in the future, there's far more continuity than change. Let's just go down the list. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, many people, probably many people who voted for President Obama thought that he was going to get into office and end this war now. Instead, what President Obama and his team did was ratify the withdrawal plan that President Bush and General Petraeus had developed. Take Afghan Pakistan. This has been a major emphasis and certainly was a major campaign emphasis of President Obama. But if you look at the details of what he's proposing, or actually not what he's proposing, but what he has set in motion, what he has approved, those are largely the plans and trajectory that the, pres the Bush team had established. President Bush said he wanted to close Guantanamo, and President Obama hasn't closed Guantanamo. What he's done is he said that a year from now, he will close Guantanamo. A year from now, we can meet again and decide, see whether, in fact, he has closed Guantanamo. President Obama, at the start of his administration, has vastly more soft power assets than President Bush had at the end of his administration. President Obama is a global celebrity. Everybody wants to have their picture taken with President Obama. But for you to really have soft power, you have to get other people to do what you want by getting them to want what you want. So the test for President Obama is not, can he get other audiences to applaud his speeches, but can, through his soft power, through his persuasion, get them to change what they're doing and start doing what President Obama wants them to do. Thus far, and it's still early, it's only 100 days, but thus far, that's been a bust. So he went to Europe, got very positive re, uh, uh, scores from people on his speeches, but in fact did not move the needle one bit on the actual policies that President Obama was seeking support from. He didn't get additional support from uh, NATO allies for Afghanistan, except for um, minimal support. He, didn't, he got lots of praise, but not lots of policy. And so, while he still has a lot of soft power, so far at least, the soft power has not yielded the results that uh, the grand strategy would want. Grand strategy is the highest level of strategy, the purposeful plan that nation states develop to reconcile their national ends with their national means. So what are the broad goals that the nation state seeks in the world? What are the challenges and opportunities that they believe they're confronting and how best to navigate those challenges and opportunities to reach their, their uh, ends. They, it involves all elements of national power, military, diplomatic, economic, cultural, the entire gambit. Well, there's an aphorism that generals fight the last war. In my view, grand strategists seek to avoid fighting the last war, that the grand strategy of the Cold War period was to avoid having a World War II, somehow to confront the Soviets without going to war in the way that they had to against Nazi Germany and Japan. In the same way, the grand strategy of the post-Cold War era has been focused on avoiding the last war, namely the Cold War. So as to manage America's position in the world, its unrivaled position as the most powerful, the superpower, the sole superpower, to manage that without creating a rival peer competitor that would match us the way the Soviets did, checking us around the globe, put it, putting at, at uh, issue U.S. interests around the globe and threatening U.S. interests around the globe the way the Soviets did during the Cold War. So the central objective of post-Cold War grand strategy, whether you're talking about President Bush, the father, President Clinton, President Bush, the son, has been to avoid another Cold War. 
This has been done through a variety of means. The first means has been to preserve a military that is far stronger than the U.S. actually needs to meet the threats that it's facing right at that moment. You combine that defense spending with the other element of this strategy, and that is appeasement of would-be rivals. So in the earliest days of the post-Cold War era, that meant reconciling uh, Japan and Germany, who were seen at the time as potential rivals, integrating them fully, in, in Germany's case, into NATO, and in Japan's case, reconciling trade wars and other kinds of conflicts that were guiding U.S. Uh, relations. But then, as the decade went on, it meant reconciling Russia, making sure that Russia had a stake in the new order and was not uh, going to be a bitter, defeated uh, ex-rival that would re-emerge uh, to re-challenge the United States. And it meant accommodating the rise of China. This has been the central challenge, accommodating the rise of China so that China would not emerge as a peer competitor that was hostile to the United States, giving China an equity stake in the existing international system, seeking to make China a responsible stakeholder, which is the way the Bush administration uh, followed it. It's still early in the Obama administration. We're only at the 100-day mark, so we don't really know. I'm not sure that the Obama team knows what their China strategy is going to be like. But as best we can tell, they're going to continue the same accommodative path that the Bush administration uh, pursued. Mm -hmm.